now I'm going to want to introduce Dr. Michael Grossman. He's a professor of cardiology at University of Michigan, Michigan Medicine, and a co-director of MISHIC. You've probably seen him plenty of times. Um, he's uh, one of our physicians um, that I work very closely with here in MISHIC, and I appreciate that you've given us the time to um, talk to us about AFib and TAVR. Um, thank you, Mike, and if you'd like to share your screen. Okay, well, thanks very much for the opportunity, Cheryl. And um, first of all, I just want to thank all of you for all the work that you're doing for our uh, patients uh, with severe aortic stenosis uh, across the state. Um, and I learned a lot in going through this subject and hope there there's some pearls that um, we can share and uh, hopefully discuss. This is uh, meant to be interactive. I think if you have questions, put them in the chat, raise your hand, Cheryl can interrupt me as well. The, the trend in, in these types of talks is to do sort of smaller bite-sized presentations and then have time for discussion rather than a uh, 45-minute grand round type presentations. So uh, hopefully there, there'll be some, some things we can all take away and, uh, uh, and there'll be some points for discussion as well. So um, atrial fibrillation after TAVR. So what is the deal? What's going on? And, and um, uh, should we be concerned? And I, I think there's actually a lot to to unpack here. First of all, we all know that atrial fibrillation is very, very common. It's actually the most common acquired arrhythmia in the US population. A um, Little less than 1% of the population less than the age of 65 has atrial fibrillation. But as uh, we age, that, that increases and as many as 10% of patients greater than 65 and significantly more than that greater than 75 actually have a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. Uh, obviously, um, prevalence increases with age and comorbidities. Um, and uh, in fact, one in eight patients um, who have underlying paroxysmal atrial fibrillation are actually undiagnosed. Um, so there are probably patients we're seeing in our TAVR clinics who have undiagnosed atrial fibrillation, and this may contribute to um, rates of AFib uh, post-TAVR as well. So what are the risk factors for the development of stroke associated with AFib, which is obviously the most a, uh, a feared complication of this condition? Um, <clears throat> you've all heard of the CHADS-VAST score. This is a relatively simple uh, uh, stroke risk prediction tool in patients who have atrial fibrillation, and it combines demographic and comorbidity factors to help us um, figure out the risk of stroke. Age is very important. The older that we are, the increased risk of stroke in patients with atrial fibrillation. Um, uh, being female also increases risk, as does heart failure, hypertension, a history of vascular disease, <coughs> including a history of myocardial infarction, peripheral arterial disease, or aortic disease itself, history of diabetes. Obviously, having a prior stroke or TIA increases your risk of a future stroke. Patients who are male with a with a score of one or greater, or female with a score of two or greater, should should be con strongly considered for anticoagulation, because their annual stroke risk is greater than two percent. Uh, and the higher your CHADS VAS score, the higher your risk of stroke in the future, and the more strong uh, the indication for anticoagulation. Um, there there is actually a uh, just published this week an update um, from the ACC uh, on management of, of atrial fibrillation that, that I found fantastic. Um, and it really includes a lot of uh, new information, particularly around the direct anticoagulants um, um, uh, relative to vitamin K antagonist Coumadin that we're all used to. Um, and so I, I'd encourage you to, to, to look at that, uh, at least look at the summaries of that. Uh, to learn a little bit more, but anticoagulation primarily with a DOAC or uh, vitamin K antagonist is recommended for patients who have a high chance VAS score, as you know. So atrial fibrillation is very, very common, particularly after cardiac surgery. And in fact, as many as 60% of patients who undergo cardiac surgery develop new AFib within 30 days. <clears throat> AFib in this population is actually associated with an increased risk of perioperative mortality, stroke, perioperative myocardial infarction, renal failure, longer stays in the ICU. It's also been associated with long-term mortality 
and the increased risk of long-term stroke. What's not clear is, is there causality? In other words, does AFib in and of itself increase these risks or is AFib a marker of a patient or patients who have more comorbidities and are sicker and may be at higher risk for these um, other long-term uh, and short-term complications? Um, certainly it's, it, it's a strong, there's a strong association and AFib is something that um, is, uh, and is often actively managed by our cardiac surgery uh, colleagues in the ICU uh, and um, uh, in the uh, perioperative period. What about AFib after TAVR? Um, reports of AFib after TAVR are actually quite variable. There have been reports as low as only 1% uh, increased risk of atrial fibrillation after TAVR to as high as 50%. Um, many of you know that the partner and Evolute low risk trials were just presented. Um, at uh, the TCT meeting uh, last month, and new AFib rates in those studies were 7% in the in the Sapien Partner 3 low-risk uh, study uh, out to 30 days, and 9.8% in the uh, Evolute low-risk, with, again, rates of AFib after SAVR much, much higher, 41% and 38% respectively. So while AFib does occur after TAVR uh, in, in in these patients, it's certainly not as common as after um, a surgical aortic valve replacement. There was a very large meta-analysis that was published um, uh, last year that, that is uh, really outstanding and, and <coughs> looked at this subject very closely. It included almost 250,000 patients who underwent TAVR. They eliminated 50, over 55,000 patients who had pre-existing atrial fibrillation. So analyzed, again, almost 250,000 patients between 2008 and 2020 in, in 179 studies. Um, the analysis basically was the patients underwent a TAVR and were followed. Um, the rate of new onset atrial fibrillation, you can see here in the, um, uh, the key figure, was 9.9%. So essentially 10% of patients after TAVR developed new uh, atrial fibrillation. 30-day event rates in these patients were much higher. So rates of death uh, in new patients with new atrial fibrillation were higher, as were rates of stroke. 30-day rates of pacemaker were also higher. Hospital length of stay uh, was longer, uh, 2.7 days, uh, and major bleeding was also higher. So again, as seen in the surgery, surgery population, new atrial fibrillation after TAVR was associated uh, with um, uh, more adverse events, including death. Again, it's not clear if this is simply an association or a marker of patients who have other comorbidities and are at higher risk, or if there is some causality, and there's probably a bit of both here, um, as you might imagine. Specifically, new onset AFib after TAVR was associated with patients who had higher STS predicted risk of mortality, patients who were older in the top figure here, patients who had underlying uh, chronic kidney disease, and patients who had peripheral arterial disease. So all these uh, factors increase the risk for atrial fibrillation after TAVR. The other thing that was seen is that access mattered, particularly patients who had transapical access were at much higher risk for atrial fibrillation, and that's not surprising. Um, those of you who, who've uh, been involved in patients who, who undergo transapical access, or maybe you're in mitral uh, programs where uh, transapical access is still used, know that these patients um, often have uh, complications after, after that uh, form of access. And, and by and large, transapical access, is, as you know, has been abandoned as an alternative form of access for patients who are undergoing TAVR. Interestingly, transfemoral, subclavian, transcarotid um, did not have higher rates of atrial fibrillation. The other thing that was seen in this meta-analysis is the valve type really didn't matter. So uh, whether it was the balloon expandable sapien family, uh, self-expanding metronic uh, evolutin core valve, uh, the mechanical lotus valve, um, all were associated um, with relatively low risks and equivalent risks of um, 
uh, new uh, atrial fibrillation. So um, the, sort of the next question is, what do we do in patients after TAVR? Should we be monitoring them for atrial fibrillation? And if so, what approach should we take? So certainly patients in the peri-TAVR period in hospital who are symptomatic or on monitor have had an evidence of atrial fibrillation uh, should be treated and or monitored. Um, as part of an electrical monitoring program after TAVR, most programs now are using um, some type of monitoring, home monitoring device. That can either be the uh, real-time device, which um, uh, we favor in our own practice because we get um, information immediately and can act on it rather than the, the uh, mail-in uh, type of devices. And obviously, implantable loop recorders are also available um, to be used to monitor patients uh, in whom we suspect um, may have atrial fibrillation. Certainly in our peri-TAVR period, when we're talking to patients and we're doing our follow-up calls, uh, a few days after uh, discharge, one of the questions that we're asking about is any any uh, feelings of palpitations, lightheadedness, other symptoms that could be uh, 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 an occult arrhythmia. Uh, and in those patients, we are often sending them a, a monitor. So for patients who don't have evidence of AFib after TAVR um, and are discharged, we really don't have guidelines where it's not recommended to routinely send these patients home on a monitor. Um, uh, but I think that uh, that's going to be an area of study in the future. Um, patients with other indications um, uh, for a monitor obviously should should get a monitor. Um, uh, in other words, patients with new bundle branch blocks, et cetera. And if we see AFib on those, it should be addressed. How should we be managing patients who have atrial fibrillation uh, after a TAVR? Um, so, first of all, patients with an indication for anticoagulation after TAVR should obviously receive anticoagulation. So, if a patient has a history of PEs or another reason to be on anticoagulation, they should receive anticoagulation uh, after TAVR. Um, we also know that anticoagulation likely attenuates the risk of leaflet thrombosis. So, in those patients with atrial fibrillation who are on uh, anticoagulation, their risk of leaflet thrombosis is lower. And there are some programs, as you know, that are routinely treating patients for at least a period of uh, uh, one to three months with anticoagulation after surgical or transcatheter or valve replacement. It's important to recognize that our patients after TAVR are high risk for stroke if they develop atrial fibrillation. Almost by definition, all these patients have a CHADS VAS score of two or greater. Um, if you think about it, they're older, they have arterial disease, uh, many of them have heart failure, many of them are diabetic, et cetera. So they have um, increased CHAS VAS score and um, should very likely be treated with anticoagulation. So what is the right choice of anticoagulation? Um, the new guidelines suggest that DOACs are actually the first line uh, because of the lower bleeding risk. They're more convenient to use. You can get patients more quickly anticoagulated to a proper level, and you don't have to deal with um, over anticoagulation, under anticoagulation, and the challenges of uh, working with Coumadin. Obviously, the downside of the DOAX is cost for many of our patients. Um, it's also important to note that unless the patient has an indication for an antiplatelet, i.e., they had a prior PCI, um, they don't need an antiplatelet. Um, in addition to uh, an anticoagulant. So if you're going to treat a patient for AFib after TAVR, use anticoagulation only, and you don't need to, to use um, uh, an antiplatelet. The other thing to, to, to mention, and this is somewhat confusing, uh, I think in the literature, at least it was to me, is that anticoagulation um, is indicated with a DOAC in what's called non-valvular AFib. So valvular atrial fibrillation means patients with mitral stenosis or patients with a mechanical valve. In those patients, they should be treated with Coumadin. DOACs really haven't been well tested in patients with mitral stenosis uh, and have not been shown to be as effective as 
uh, Coumadin in patients with um, uh, mechanical aortic valve. So unless the patient has mitral stenosis, which is relatively rare in the U.S., or they have a mechanical valve, again, DOACs are the first line choice. Now, if patients have had a recent PCI, then obviously they need antiplatelet therapy in addition to anticoagulant for new AFib or AFib uh, in general. Uh, and the treatment strategy in those patients, first line is a DOAC plus clopidogrel, um, lower risk of bleeding with a DOAC plus clopidogrel as opposed to other uh, antiplatelet uh, medications. Um, it's important that we consider bleeding risk in all of our patients, particularly our older patients who've undergone uh, TAVR, but the reality is bleeding risk is really a contraindication um, to treating patients with anticoagulation who have a history uh, of atrial fibrillation. Uh, it needs to be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. Even patients who've had recent active bleeding um, often can get anticoagulation and get, get it safely. Um, and then the next question is, how long do we treat patients with new AFib after TAVR? Again, not clear, um, but we probably should be reevaluating these patients at three to six months after their TAVR, see if they still have evidence of underlying atrial fibrillation or paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. And again, many of these patients should be treated or should be uh, evaluated with home monitoring and or an implantable loop recorder. Uh, and it may be safe to um, de-escalate anticoagulation in those patients. And finally, <clears throat> the other question that comes up, and there's actually a trial that looked at uh, left atrial appendage closure in patients um, who are at high bleeding risk, who've undergone TAVR. Um, and it's actually um, uh, been shown to be safe uh, and in a, a relatively small trial of combining left atrial appendage occlusion with TAVR. <laughs> Uh, in the same procedure that that's actually uh, been shown to be safe and associated with lower bleeding than uh, treating patients with anticoagulation. So that may be something that we consider in the future for many of these patients. So new AFib after TAVR occurs in approximately 10% of patients. Um, that's something that I learned uh, uh, from going through this data. Uh, and it's certainly something that uh, we all need to um, uh, keep, in, keep in mind as we're managing the, these patients in the peritaver period. Uh, the risk of AFib increases with age and comorbidities. Uh, patients with higher STS scores, CKD, PAD, uh, and those who undergo um, more aggressive surgical access, particularly transapical, are more likely to develop AFib. Um, it's very important to note that AFib after TAVR is associated with adverse outcome. There's increased mortality, stroke, major bleeding, increased risk of new, new pacemakers, increased risk of hospital stay. Um, in patients who, in whom we suspect um, or we feel are at risk for AFib, um, they should be monitored, obviously, in hospital and then outpatient um, uh, in those who are suspected or have symptoms consistent with atrial fibrillation. Um, management for these patients is anticoagulation and, and um, rate and sometimes rhythm control. Um, first line therapy uh, are the direct anticoagulants, so Pixaban, Xeralto, et cetera, um, with second line therapy, um, Coumadin, uh, and then obviously you, under, you know the challenges of, uh, uh, of Coumadin for many of our patients. And again, uh, we should probably be reevaluating these patients after TAVR who have paroxysmal or new AFib. Uh, at, at three to six months uh, to see if they're, uh, if the AFib has calmed down and uh, potentially whether or not they can come off their anticoagulation. <clears throat>